Buonasera a tutti, sia ai presenti che ai colleghi che vedo connessi online e ai colleghi amici di lei da molte sedi. È un piacere per me presentare questo seminario del professore Magnano, che probabilmente molti di voi conoscono, e che si tratta di un argomento abbastanza intrigante. Sarà lui a spiegarvi. Ho il piacere di conoscere e collaborare con Mike da diversi anni e eh, posso solo dire, dire che è una persona dai molti conti interessi e che in particolare eh, lavora nel campo della storia nucleare e eh, anche nella fisica del neutrino. So, Mike, so, Mike, I just said, so, so, uh, said if you were in Italian, Italian. <laughs> and now I leave the screen to you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, I, I I'm, I'm ashamed to say that, that I, I speak very few words in Italian, and you, you were probably looking at my name and thinking, oh, good, I don't have to listen to a talk in English. I'm a uh, second generation American. Um, so, so I have learned very little Italian growing up in the United States, so I do apologize. Um, this has been a very interesting topic that I've been working on the past uh, several years. I've been interested in this since I was in grad school over 20 years ago and uh, uh, have worked on it very slowly over the last several years. And then uh, maybe three or four years ago, we got funding for this project. And so now I have to do it, whether I want to do it or not. Um, so, so this is uh, funded by the Moore Foundation and have also received uh, support from the Fulbright and the National Science Foundation in the United States. And, and these, are, these are my collaborators uh, here. I work very closely with these people. And so this is a talk about um, uh, how, how biomolecular chirality may be formed in space, as well as some of the theories and some of the work on that. Uh, I like to call this talk Um, th this is what happens when physicists try to do biology, uh, because uh, we, we, as a physicist, I know very little about biology. Um, okay, so th this is very interdisciplinary in nature. Uh, I, I, I will confess that, that I am not a biologist, I, I, I am not a chemist, and, and I suppose on occasion I do physics. Uh, most of my work has been in physics anyway. And this work actually occurs in, in you know, the, the overlap of these, including astronomy and planetary science, uh, biochemistry. Um, it's very interdisciplinary. For this talk, I'm going to try to uh, keep the math to a minimum. I will show a, a little bit of math. It does get a little involved, um, but I don't want to take up too much time with the mathematics, but just uh, show you a little bit of the concept of what we are working on. Um, uh, the main questions that, that I've been dealing with over the past several years is, is first of all, how, how is amino acid chirality selected in space? I will define that. Uh, I will discuss that. I, I see we have a lot of students as well. And, and uh, um, so, so we will uh, define some basic terms. Is there a fundamental physics reason or a consideration to biomolecular chirality? And then can, can we develop experiments? Can we simulate this? Can we simulate the effects? Um, which were responsible for biomolecular chirality. And so I'll talk about that. This is the outline on the left-hand side here. Uh, this is actually quite an important topic. The National Academy of Sciences in the United States um, in their last decadal survey said this was one of the biggest questions in astronomy and astrophysics today is, is um, the formation of biomolecules in stellar environments, not only how they were formed, but how was molecular chirality formed. And also, um, several years ago, uh, um, the Science Magazine put out a, a publication called the Top 125 Questions in Science, and this question appeared in there as well. So including questions on the origin of the elements, uh, questions covering physics, astronomy, biology, and this question, where does biomolecular chirality come from? So this is a subset of astrobiology. And astrobiology is a very, very broad field. It's extremely broad. It covers uh, uh, topics like the origin of life, um, exoplanets, 
uh, the search for exoplanets, which has been very popular these days. Now it's stretching into exoplanet atmospheres. And uh, finally, it's getting into things like planetary habitability. So for example, can humans inhabit or can life inhabit other planets? Can humans go to other planets and, and, and conquer them? Okay, because that sounds, uh, that's my you know, least favorite topic because it sounds so scary. Um, as well as prebiotic chemistry. And this talk uh, falls into that topic. Now within the field of prebiotic chemistry, there are actually several subfields as well, um, including the origins of biomolecules, as well as things like cell membranes, how those form, what was the transition from chemistry to life. Of course, that de requires a definition of life. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about fundamental interactions in prebiotic chemistry and how that came to be. So first of all, let me start off with some very basic definitions. And for those chemists out there, I apologize, um, but I am a physicist, so I'm going to start very basically. Um, this is a, a picture of an amino acid on the left-hand side. Okay, it's, it's defined by a, a central carbon atom. Um, it's got this, this separate uh, nitrile or amine group uh, connected to it, then a carboxyl group, and then some arbitrary side chain. And that side chain can be several different things, including aromatic rings, as well as some, some, some phospholipid chains and things like that. And then there's a spoke here. So you, when I think of an amino acid, this is what I think of here. Now, it's an asymmetric molecule. It can't be rotated uh, um, around itself. It has no planes of symmetry. And so because it's asymmetric, I can do a parity inversion on it. I can reverse the coordinates and get a mirror image for that molecule. So we say it, it has chirality, and that's from the Greek word for hand, and so there's these pictures of the hands back there, and you can see we, we, we arbitrarily define a left-handed and a right-handed amino acid. And so you cannot rotate or, or flip or translate the left-handed molecule in any way so that it sits on top of the right-handed molecule. And there's a picture of one amino acid down here. This is uh, uh, um, alanine, just by example, showing you the left and the right-handed forms of that molecule. And this idea of, of, of chirality in molecules was studied long ago by uh, Louis Pasteur, uh, who in, in true French fashion extracted tartaric acid from wine, and he noticed that it was chiral. And he studied the optical properties of that. So these are optically active. That means left-handed molecules behave differently with polarized light than right-handed molecules behave. So that's particularly interesting. That automatically tells us there's an electromagnetic interaction. And just for, for reference, there's a picture of Louis Pasteur down there in his two chiral states. Okay. So why is this interesting to someone who might be an astrophysicist or someone who might be a, a, a particle physicist even? Well, the interest comes from this picture on the left-hand side. And, and this is just a, just, just a rock. It looks like a rock. This is a very important looking rock. Um, this is a piece of the Murchison meteorite, which fell onto Australia about 1969 or so. And um, this Murchison meteorite was particularly interesting because it's one of the most studied meteorites in terms of organic molecules. Of course, there have been other meteorites studied since then. Um, this one uh, has amino acids in it, among other organic molecules. But certainly, there were amino acids found in this meteorite. Now, let me give you a few more definitions because you're going to hear me say this a lot. Um, this term here, this, we call this the enantiomeric excess, or EE. If I have a population of amino acids, the enantiomeric excess is the relative left-right difference between them. It, it, it's, it's the same mathematical formula for polarization, a okay, similar uh, form there. And so just for, just for reference, we could say that uh, if, if my population is all left-handed, it has an EE of one. If it's all right-handed, it has an EE of minus one. If it's evenly mixed with equal numbers of left and right-handed, it's an EE of zero. We call that racemic. So just some vocabulary there. So getting back to this meteorite, why was this meteorite so particularly 
interesting for the following reason, the following two reasons, in fact. Um, actually, before I get to the meteorite, let me mention sort of amazing fact number one. Okay, amazing fact number one is that all biologically relevant amino acids are left-handed. Okay, um, whether life selects it that way or whether life started that way and evolved around that, we're not sure yet. But uh, um, within our bodies, within the, the plants outside, the lunch you ate, um, uh, all the amino acids in there were, were left-handed. Our body only uses left-handed amino acids. Life only uses left-handed amino acids. Now, if I were to make an amino acid soup in the laboratory, that I would get equal amounts of left and right-handed, but the right-handed ones are not used by life. Life does not select them for some reason or another. And the question of how that got to be is one of the, the driving questions in biological uh, prebiotic evolution. Now, amazing fact number two comes to this meteorite again, and that is on this meteorite, they found amino acids, but very interestingly, they found more left-handed amino acids than right-handed amino acids. Now it wasn't it wasn't homo it wasn't homochiral it wasn't all 100% left-handed, but but it was predominantly left-handed, which is particularly interesting because now this leads to theories that possibly uh, um, uh, biochemistry might have been triggered by the last meteoric bombardment or might have been influenced by amino acids um, on meteorites. Uh, incidentally, the last major meteoric bombardment on the Earth occurred just as life was beginning to evolve. Okay. But at the very least, this tells us that there can be some non-biological reason for chirality to be selected in space as well as on Earth. It may not be the same reason, but there is some reason. And so, so that alone is an interesting study, and that's what we're working on here. That's what my colleagues and I are working on. Um, just some other interesting facts here. Uh, of course, organic molecules have been studied by the astronomers. I, I, I think I heard we have some astronomers in the, in the crowd today. So um, radio astronomy spends a lot of time looking for organic molecules because their excitation states are in the radio band. Um, uh, possibly, we're, we're not sure yet, but, um, possibly glycine was discovered in Sagittarius 2b, one of these star-forming regions. Uh, a cloud of dust towards the center of the galaxy. Um, there have been other studies as well. And then very recently, the, the, the study of bodies within our solar system has become quite important. Um, organic molecules, uh, uh, glycine and some of its precursors were discovered in, in comets. There was this comet mission recently, um, this mission where they, they, they harpooned a comet and then re reeled themselves into the comet and, and landed. Um, and then uh, most recently was Hayabusa, Hayabusa 2. Next, we're going to get results from Osiris Rex, hopefully. Uh, Hayabusa 2 just landed about last year or so. And um, preliminary results indicate that they found amino acids from the Hayabusa 2 mission, which collected soil, a soil sample from an asteroid. Um, they haven't gone too much into the details of that, but there have been a few preliminary talks at workshops that said, yes, we found amino acids on an asteroid, which is quite compelling because asteroids are generally considered to be sort of frozen in from the birth of our solar system or at least have some kind of a history to them. And so um, that is an interesting result as well. And that's within our own solar system. <laughs> Now, there's something else that's particularly interesting about the amino acids that were found on meteorites. And this was a, a very interesting paper um, by Alcila um, several years ago already, in which she looked at the, the isotopic abundances of amino acids um, found in meteorites. And just to give you a few definitions here, okay, just to give you a few definitions. If I am looking at the deuterium abundance in a meteorite, uh, I, I define this quantity um, to be the, the ratio uh, of deuterium, the hydrogen in the sample over deuterium, the hydrogen um, from a standard sample, so, say on the Earth, for example. 
and then minus one, and then t t times a thousand. By the way, this is a term I had to learn as a physicist. I just thought this was a fancy way of writing percent. Uh, nope, it means per, per 1,000. And, and so I, I struggled with that one for several weeks before I finally understood it was a, a new, new symbol. Same thing for, for nitrogen 15. Um, this term here is defined to be the ratio of nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14 over some standard sample. Um, in, in this case, it's generally Earth's atmosphere is our standard sample. And so when we look at samples, when we look at actual organic molecules, amino acids in meteorites, um, we get a plot that looks like this. We can plot the deuterium, delta D, over the nitrogen abundance shift. And each one of these dots represents a different measurement. And they come from multiple meteorites to produce this plot here. Right? Um, and so what's particularly interesting, first of all, is Zero, zero would be a sample that matches exactly what we see on the Earth. So the amino acids in this meteorite, if they were what we saw on the Earth, if they had the same amount of deuterium and the same amount of nitrogen 15, that, that number would be zero. But if you look at it, deuterium can, can vary by, by several times. There can be several times more deuterium in meteoric amino, amino acids than in amino acids on Earth. And for nitrogen, remember these numbers are, are times a thousand, there can be on the order of 10 or 20 percent more nitrogen 15 in amino acids. So there's enhanced deuterium and enhanced nitrogen 15 in meteoric amino acids. This is somewhat interesting because these are two very different scales. So remember this, we're going to get back to this. There's several reasons for uh, why that may have happened. Um, there could be some chemical fractionation. Uh, there could be some cold chemistry, surface chemistry. Um, I'll talk about one possible reason here. But uh, uh, um, uh, let's just remember this plot. And scientists have also studied carbon-13 carbon and lithium and as well as boron um, in, in meteorites. But, but these particular, particular samples here are quite interesting just because they cover two different ranges, a somewhat small range and a very large range here. So first question is, how, how is amino acid homochirality triggered or created either on the Earth or in some other stellar environment? And there are several theories, several ideas. It's still uh, uh, open for discussion. There's still a lot of discussion on it, but there are several ideas. Um, stochastic processes just involve things like just a random process probably a thermal process, maybe some crystallization in, in, in the ocean or something like that. And then you have a crystal of all the same amino acids and the other one might have been burned up or something and, and, and whatever you had left survives or something. And then there are uh, deterministic processes. These are things where you have an actual physical process which drives the amino acids in one direction. And some of these have been tested and some of them have been found to work in one degree or another. Um, uh, the, the people in France, uh, in Nice, do a lot of work with circularly polarized light. They've done a lot of interesting work with that. Definitely worth looking that up. Um, we've had people in uh, um, the University of Nebraska who've done work with um, spin polarized electrons. Uh, and those are, those are both atomic effects. Those deal with the electron orbitals in a molecule as opposed to any possible nuclear interaction. Okay, I'm going to talk primarily about, and this, this is um, primarily what my colleagues and I have done over the past several years, is the possibility that maybe there is uh, an astroparticle effect involved in the formation of biomolecular chirality. And the reason I'm going to talk about that is because we know amino acids have to have some selection, there has to be some way of, of selecting left-handed or right-handed amino acids in stellar environments. We found amino acids deep in meteorites. They have to survive a long time. Um, there could potentially be some process that's able to penetrate deep in, into meteorites. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. I will say um, the field is still highly speculative. Uh, right now, we are still dealing with a theoretical aspect of this. But I will talk about some possible experiments at the end of this talk. OK, so, so again, I'm just going to talk about 
um, what we call nuclear and magnetochiral effects. I'm going to talk about is there a relationship between nuclear physics and, and chirality? Of course there is. We know there is. Those who are nuclear physicists know that there's a relationship. More importantly, is there a relationship between nuclear physics and, and, and biological, uh, biochemical chirality? And one of the theories my colleagues and I came up with is, is trying to answer this question, can, can polarized leptons, um, such as electrons, muons, uh, and, and in some very exotic cases, neutrinos, um, induce chirality in, in amino acids? We're not the first ones to study this. We're not the first ones to look at this question. This question has been examined before. Uh, this was uh, some really interesting work by uh, Tim Gay's group. Uh, out of the University of Nebraska, in which he looked at very low energy polarized electrons um, uh, on a chiral molecule. And what he did was he changed the energy of those electrons, and then he just shot these electrons at, at, at a, 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 a gas of bromocamphor, which is a chiral molecule. It's not an amino acid, but it's still chiral. And then he measured the asymmetry or the EE or the enantiomeric excess of that when he was done. And you could see he got very low asymmetries. Uh, of course, on, on Earth in biology, the asymmetry is 100%. Um, on meteorites, it's, it's on the order of several percent and in some cases, several tens of percents. Uh, and he noticed that if you use right-handed electrons and left-handed electrons, that chiral shift flips, which is good. That, that makes sense. Um, uh, also note that the electron energy here, it's negative on the scale. That's because it was an offset in, in, his, in his voltage. This is more like raw data here. But you can see that he was able to induce some sort of chirality that way. That, of course, was an atomic effect or molecular effect. He was breaking bonds in molecules because he was working at the electron volt scale. The question is, is at, at the Nuclear scale, at the astrophysics scale, is there an effect? And so my colleagues and I um, are thinking about this figure here. This experiment on the left-hand side operates down here. This experiment by Tim Gay and his, his colleagues operates way down here at very low electron energy and, and Earth fields. Okay? Um, we're interested in the possibility that could high-energy electrons uh, could high energy leptons um, at fields ranging from, from somewhat low to very high fields possibly induce a, a chiral effect here? So is there a magnetochiral effect at high energy? And the reason is, is because if you have higher energy leptons, you're able to, one, um, penetrate uh, deeper into asteroids and meteoroids. Um, two, a lot of cosmic rays are fairly high energy. Um, uh, Three, the higher energy the lepton, the more likely it is to be spin polarized. So for example, high energy cosmic rays could be spin polarized in one direction or the other. Low energy electrons, um, finding uh, purely polarized low energy electrons is a little trickier in nature. And so that's where we're studying right now. Let me just give you a, a starting point. Let me tell you the, the, the toy model that we uh, started at that got our thinking about this. If we think about a chiral effect at the nuclear level and somehow try to link that to a chiral effect at the molecular level, well, we do know about chirality at the nuclear level. Every nuclear physicist knows about chirality at the nuclear level. So um, uh, while I was originally apologizing to the chemists, I'm now going to apologize to the nuclear physicists for this uh, next slide here, but just consider this, this reaction here, okay? Nitrogen-14, which has a spin of one. Nitrogen-14 is, is contained within all amino acids. It's what defines an amino acid. And then some lepton, which, which has a spin of one half. Okay, if we think about that reaction, that weak interaction, it could be something like inverse beta decay. It could even be electron capture or some other type of decay. Okay, how those spins are aligned are going to, are going to dictate the reaction rate, okay? Uh, so this is certainly semi-classical. You have carbon-14, which has a spin of zero, and then this outgoing electron, which has a spin of one-half. 
So if the nitrogen 14 and the incoming lepton, in this case, I'm just, just picking uh, anti-neutrino capture because anti-neutrinos are easy. They, they've all got the same uh, helicity, the same chirality. If I pick that and their spins are anti-aligned, I've got a net spin of one half and then the electron can go out and carry away that angular momentum. However, if they are aligned and, and every first year nuclear physics student has, has done this or, or at least discussed this, if they're aligned, um, I have a, a, a spin of three halves. The outgoing electron still has a spin of one half. It's in the intrinsic spin. We have to carry away that angular momentum somehow. And that angular momentum, um, the what reason, or rather because we have to carry it away, that that reaction is, is suppressed. So it's suppressed by as much as a thousand or so, depending on the reaction. So if we can think of some situation where we have a source of spin polarized leptons, such as electrons, muons, uh, e even neutrinos uh, for very exotic situations. And we have uh, nitrogen, which has a net non-zero polarization or magnetization, such as in a magnetic field, then we can set up a situation where weak transitions are going to depend on whether that nitrogen is aligned with the electron spin or against the electron spin. Semi-classically, you can think of it as, as being aligned e even e in an arbitrary direction as well. Of course, the angular momentum has to be conserved. You can also imagine situations where you might have uh, um, angular momentum transfer via photon uh, electromagnetic interaction. So you might have like an M1 uh, transition versus an E1 transition or, or something else like that, okay? Um, of course, nuclear spin is not molecular chirality. If I have a nitrogen nucleus uh, in a molecule, it, it could in principle point any, any, you know, its spin, its magnetization, its magnetic moment could in principle point any which way, okay? And then the we can think of the molecule in some cases as acting almost independently of it. So the question is, even if we can, uh, can align a nuclear spin, say in a strong magnetic field, can we somehow couple this nuclear spin to the molecular chirality? And the answer is yes. The answer is we have been doing this for almost 100 years uh, with, with nuclear magnetic resonance. Oh, I said, I, I, I was told I can only call it magnetic resonance here. With, with magnetic resonance, okay? Hospitals have been doing this for a long time with magnetic resonance. They look at the shapes, the types of molecules. They characterize molecules by looking at the spins of the nuclei within those molecules. And those spins change based on the influence of the molecule around the nucleus. And let me show you ju just, uh, just a little bit of math, uh, be just because this is, um, this is kind of beautiful math here. So, so we won't get too heavily into the math, but um, this, is, this is the, uh, the electronic magnetic Hamiltonian. So if I have a molecule in a magnetic field, and we could think of a magnetic field that's several Tesla. We could think of a magnetic field that's more like Earth's field. We could think of really strong magnetic fields of several tens of Tesla or more, um, say in the vicinity of a neutron star or something like that. Uh, but if we are in a magnetic field, of course, you have to include the vector potential in the spin Hamiltonian. You sum over all of the electrons in that molecule. And this vector potential consists of these two terms. There's this term here which couples the magnetic field to the molecule itself, couples the magnetic field to the electrons themselves. And then there's this term here, which couples the nuclear magnetic moment to the electrons, okay? So, so think of the nitrogen, for example, the nitrogen magnetic moment, it's gonna have a spin, it's going to have a magnetic moment. There's that term that couples that magnetic moment to the electrons. There's an interaction there. The reason I like looking at this is the following. This is a, the, the, the magnetic moment of, of, of any nucleus, but of, of, of nitrogen, for example, the magnetic moment is, 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 a, is an axial vector. It, it, um, under a parity transformation, it, it does not change. The electron position is a polar vector. So under a parity transformation, it changes sign, okay? The electron position is 
determined by the molecular shape. That means that this term here is actually uh, a, a, um, a pseudo vector. It, um, it changes sign under a parity transformation. So that means if I have a left-handed molecule and a right-handed molecule, this term is going to be different. Even though they're the same shape, I take the mirror image, that term's going to be different, um, all other things being equal. So the magnetic field, external magnetic field is equal. And this is a really good paper, very easy to understand paper here, uh, um, especially if, if you're a student, um, recommend this paper down here, Facelli, 2010. Uh, I'm just going to mention this right here. We'll talk about it in a little bit. That's the magnetic shielding tensor, the nuclear magnetic shielding tensor. That dictates how, how the magnetic field, how the molecule influences the magnetic field uh, at the nucleus, at the location of the nucleus, or how the magnetic field at the location of the nucleus changes in a molecule. Um, the one thing I do want you to note is um, the subscripts correspond to coordinates, X, Y, and Z. Um, this, so it's a, it's a matrix. This matrix is, is not diagonal and it is not symmetric, okay? And that's what's important to note. And it changes sign, the off-diagonal elements change sign under a parity transformation. So if I go from a left-handed molecule to a right-handed molecule, those off-diagonal elements become the opposite sign. Okay, and that's because this is this is a, a um, this changes sign under a parity transformation, and so a lot of this work involves modeling molecular orbitals, and then finding the magnetic properties of those orbitals, and then solving for this Hamiltonian. So somewhat code intensive, but not too bad. You you could do it on uh, uh, a couple tens of processors pretty easily. Okay, and up until I started this project, this, this is how I thought of every molecule. A, a bunch of balls attached to sticks. I thought that this is, you know, this is, I'm a physicist, this is what molecules look like. Of course, of course, we know that's not what they look like. Um, what we have to do is we've got to think of molecules as, as being the, the electron wave functions surrounding these. And of course, we've done that before. You've probably done the hydrogen molecule or the, the, the hydrogen plus molecule, for example. Um, in this case, we're, we're solving the, the Hamiltonian for the entire electron cloud in the molecule. So getting back to this Hamiltonian here, what this means is that in an external magnetic field, I could have a situation like this, where I have a, a lepton interacting with the molecule and the lepton can have a spin. Okay? If it's a relativistic lepton, um, it could almost be a direct particle, can have a, a definitive spin. If we're in a magnetic field, it can certainly have a, a, a certain helicity. Um, and then the nuclear spin is going to depend on, and when I say nuclear spin, I mean average nuclear magnetization because you also have thermal effects. The nuclear spin is also going to depend on whether the molecule is left-handed or right-handed. And um, semi-classically, you can think of the rate of interaction as being proportional to the, the angle between those two spins. So if I have a, a magnetic environment, such as the surface of the earth, um, uh, magnetite in, in a meteoroid, um, meteoroid orbiting a magnetic body, um, and I have a source of leptons such as cosmic rays, uh, um, let's say it's really exotic and I have neutrino emission from a neutron star, there's going to be a different reaction rate with those leptons depending on whether the molecule is left-handed or right-handed. You're going to destroy more of one molecule, more of one chirality than the other. So this is what's called a selective destruction mechanism. Okay. And by the way, here's, here's how we use the shielding tensor. Um, the external magnetic field, so this is the component of the magnetic field at the nucleus. So I'm sitting on the nucleus. What does the magnetic field look like? Um, it's going to equal the external magnetic field minus this, this shield, this component of the shielding tensor times the uh, um, component of the external magnetic field as well. Okay, And because it's off diagonal, you have to get those off diagonal elements. That means a magnetic field pointing in the Z direction can have an effect on the magnetic field in the X and the Y direction at the nucleus because of those off diagonal elements 
in the Hamiltonian. So this is particularly interesting. Um, this electron shielding tensor is different for each chirality. The magnetic field depends on chirality and, and, and the lepton cross-section can then depend on chirality. And this, this whole idea of the magnetic shielding tensor, this is nothing new. This has been known for a couple decades already. Uh, it's studied in NMR. Um, there's not really a good way to study it in NMR yet, but I'm gonna talk about a possibility at the end of this talk. Um, so what we had to do was we had to go through the, uh, I showed that picture of valine on a previous slide. This is how we have to think about it. This is a mapping uh, of the uh, um, uh, off diagonal component. This is the uh, XZ component of the shielding tensor using a mean field self consistent, uh, 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 multi channel self consistent field model for valine. Um, and these colors represent the magnitude of the shielding tensor for, for nitrogen. Uh, um, mapped onto an electron uh, um, surface, mapped onto a surface of, of uh, constant electron um, charge current. Um, just the reason I show you that is just to show you that there is a, a mapping. Uh, it can change by, in some cases, uh, a, a few parts in a million. Uh, it can change by some cases, a few parts in a thousand, or in, in, in extreme cases, a few parts in a, in a hundred. Um, for a right-handed molecule, those colors would be opposite. Those colors would be mapped differently. And I also like to show this because it's kind of a pretty picture. The, the people who do all the supernova modeling show pretty pictures. Um, this is probably as close as I can get, I guess. Um, okay, so, so note that the electrons in the molecule shift the magnitude and the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, you, you can almost think of Lenz's law. Those electrons actually interact with the magnetic field and it depends on the shape of the molecule. Um, and changes uh, over all the rates. We see this in nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay, so the question is where would this sort of effect happen? Anywhere you have a magnetic field and a source of polarized leptons. Okay? That means the surface of the earth, for example. You could have polarized cosmic rays, okay? Uh, you can also, in, in meteorites, you can have uh, um, for example, really exotic case, maybe a meteorite flying by a neutron star where you have a very strong magnetic field and a fairly intense uh, um, flux of neutrinos. It's, it's intense enough that you can actually get some non-zero uh, non, um, interactions, non-trivial interactions in there. Okay, so, so there are several environments that we have examined. Of course, we started off examining the most exotic environments we could think of. We probably started off doing the, the crazy thing first, and then we started getting into more realistic environments. But let me show you a couple results here. Um, here's a, a very, this is one of the first cases we studied, the very exotic case, uh, a meteoroid flying by a neutron star. It sounds very exotic, but it may not be because there's um, this possibility that um, the solar system was formed from a wolf rayet bubble some star that blew off its outer envelope, uh, formed a neutron star, and then all this dust and gas and everything around it um, uh, can undergo organic chemistry and you have all this stuff orbiting it. So if you have something like a hyperbolic orbit, for example, of a meteoroid around a neutron star, you have a very strong field. You have an intense flux of, of in this case, neutrinos, which are really nice because they have definite chirality, definite helicity. And um, you can get uh, alignment of the molecules. This effect, by the way, works in an isotropic environment. If all the molecules are isotropically oriented, uh, this effect still works. Um, it's enhanced if the molecules are aligned, say in a crystal or by an external magnetic field or an ele external electric field. And so this uh, uh, result here on the left-hand side, this is the EE. This was for uh, the valine molecule as a function of the, the point of closest approach of the meteorite and um, the time. You know, we're talking um, uh, several thousand kilometers here, but pretty close, certainly well outside the neutron star, but still quite close, uh, um, moving quite fast. And you can see we, we get EEs up, up you know, in the 10 to the minus four, above 10 to the minus four. Uh, and if it hung around a little longer, we could get the EEs up to a couple percent or so. So that was a promising result. And then we started examining other things. But um, another question is, what about isotopic abundances? 
we know that the amino acids have an abundance of deuterium in them and uh, nitrogen 15, we could examine the carbon 13. And so we put our amino acids in the exact same environment that we studied the enantiomeric excess in to look at the isotopic abundances. And we ran a nuclear reaction network here uh, um, where we studied everything up to around uh, um, um, neon or so. Uh, and, and our reactions included uh, charge current reactions. So for example, electron capture, um, neutral current reactions, uh, as well as neutron capture. And the reason we include neutron capture is because if you're an amino acid embedded in a meteorite um, and you're studying, for example, uh, neutrino interactions or cosmic ray, um, uh, excuse me, high energy electron interactions, you're going to get neutron spallation from the iron in the meteorite. So if you have some cavity in there, you could get extra neutrons. And so we studied uh, the neutron flux as well. Um, and it turns out that our results look like this. This is that very first figure I showed where we looked at the deuterium abundance versus nitrogen 15 abundance. The dots again are the, the observations. The dots are the measurements. Um, these lines are three different models here. And the way you work, the way it works is the longer the meteorite is exposed to the lepton flux, the farther along you go on this line. So the, the larger number of uh, um, lepton interactions in the meteorite. So obviously there's a lot of scatter in the data. I mean, tons of scatter. We weren't looking for an exact match, but um, what you can see is the lines aren't off by orders of magnitude. Remember deuterium varies by you know, factors of six or seven or eight, whereas nitrogen 15 varies by only a couple tens of percent. And so the lines go through the data. Obviously, it's, it's, it's suggestive. It's certainly not, uh, um, certainly not uh, uh, um, proof, but it is, it is compelling. It's suggestive. We did the same thing for nitrogen 15 and carbon 13. Take a look. Nitrogen 15 varies by a few tens of percent. Carbon 13 only varies by a couple percent, and it's all around zero. So, so carbon-13 doesn't change much at all. Now, our, our models were off a little bit in the carbon-13, and that could be the initial conditions of our model. But note that there's very little change in the carbon-13 in our models, which kind of kind of goes along with the data. The carbon-13 doesn't change as much, whereas the nitrogen-15 changes a lot. So that was interesting. And that's something we're continuing to study. We're continuing to look at the nuclear effects there. And then one other thing that we just started looking at was um, we can produce enantiomeric excesses of a couple percent, but we haven't included autocatalysis in our models. We haven't included any possible chemical influence in our models. So what if we have autocatalysis occurring concurrently with our nuclear interactions and so we looked at that with two very simple autocatalysis mechanisms. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna go back and apologize to my chemistry friends again, because they're probably thinking, oh, this is just baby chemistry. Um, and it probably is. Uh, we looked at two models. Um, one is called a, an antagonism model. And the only thing you have to remember for this one is that um, the point of EE equals zero racemic mixtures is, is an unstable equilibrium point, which means if I just tip the amino acids in one direction towards left or right, it will drive them all the way to 100%. So that's kind of an easy model. And by the way, biochemistry tends to do that. Life likes to do that. We also looked at one that was a little more stringent. We looked at just a plain autocatalysis model. This is a point where the, the EE equals zero is a stable equilibrium point. So if I if I induce some chirality, after a while, the molecules will come back to a perfect balance, okay? And so just to show you some results, I, I see my time is running very fast, so I will show some results here. Um, for the antagonism model, where, where um, EE is equal zero is unstable, um, you can see, uh, uh, here's a model. This is just one model we did uh, out of many, but this gives you an uh, a flavor of what we're doing. A, a here is the catalyst. This is the abundance of the catalyst in our in our model. Um, red is left. 
D is, is right. And so you can see we, we tip it just a little bit in one direction and the left skyrockets and the D um, goes way down. Now, 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 of course, you might think of a situation where we tip it in the other direction and the opposite would happen. And, and that could be a possibility and that's something we're trying to figure out right now. And here, here's, the, here's the EE for this model. You know, you're talking about a, a couple hours for this to happen. So, so some exposure of a few hours. Okay, um, we looked at the, the autocatalysis only model. Um, and this involved weak interactions providing a, a constant push towards homochirality. So this might be something like um, Earth's atmosphere where you have constant influence from say cosmic rays over, over thousands of years or possibly millions of years. One nice thing about what we're doing is time really isn't a constraint. Uh, we, we have all the time we want when we do these calculations because uh, um, uh, life um, um, prebiotic chemistry could have evolved over a million years and it won't matter to us. Um, on the left hand side, uh, kind of tiny here, you can see a population of left and right handed molecules. Note, this is over something like billions, uh, um, excuse me, 10 to the eighth seconds, 10 to the ninth seconds or so, so about 10, 10 years, 100 years. Um, this, this is a zoom in of the very first few hundred seconds, um, by the way, and that, that, that's kind of interesting. You get, it, it starts off very unstable, and, and then it stabilizes, and then it slowly gets pushed in one direction. And if we look at the EE, we can see over a, a very long time, it, it, it just continues to rise. And, and we just stopped the model after um, a couple, um, uh, about 10 to the eighth, 10 to the nine seconds or so. Okay, I just wanna take a few more minutes here and talk about what's next. Um, one thing we'd like to do first of all is, is verify our, our molecular calculations, is verify our, 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 our calculations of the shield intensor to first of all, see, see if we started off at the right point. Try to simulate um, this effect would be another kind of a fun experiment to do. So we're starting off very simply um, with an NMR experiment. Uh, we're collaborating with the Florida High Magnetic Field Laboratory, um, where we can create a, a method for measuring the shield and tensor within a chiral molecule. <coughs> now it can be done with NMR, but it's a little complicated. You need a, a, a chiral reagent and you need to do some weird chemistry. We're trying to do it without all that. We're trying to develop a, a brand new probe um, where we can put, say, a solidified or a crystallized amino acid in there and, and rotate it about uh, uh, um, inside the magnetic field and look at the, the shift in the internal field. So look at the shift in the signal. This has been approved. Uh, um, we actually have a probe. Um, uh, I believe it's been shipped from Germany right now. Um, we went through some probe design there. And uh, it, it'll be a nice Christmas present for me. Um, and, and, and the nice thing about this is it's a nice relationship between us and the, the people at the High Magnetic Field Lab because uh, I, I'm interested in the astrophysics. They're interested in, in just doing some new NMR. And so by the time we're all done, they get, they get to have a new probe and I get to have some really, really fascinating astrophysics experiments. I'm thinking more into the future. I'm talking with people at the uh, Jefferson mm -hmm. uh, Laboratory. Um, they uh, uh, are able to produce polarized electron beams. And so we're thinking about ways of trying to induce this effect using high energy polarized electron beams uh, um, with a polarized target, either polarized nuclear target or um, polarized molecular target. It, it, it's really interesting because because to me, high energy is MEV, to them high energy is GEV and TEV. And so, so they've actually got to step back a little bit to, to help me out. Um, we're still speculating about how to do this, how this might work, but there, there has been some discussion and there has been at least some interest there. Okay, um, I am very much out of time. I do apologize, I went over a little bit. So let me just um, put up my conclusions uh, and, and let me thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Uh, um, hope everyone has a great Christmas and um, uh, thank you for staying late on, on almost Christmas break. So thank you. Okay, questions. Thank you, Mike. Um, please, you, there are some questions. Uh, the people who's online, please help your.
raise your hand because other, otherwise we, not, we cannot see if you want to ask a question or if, if there is someone here in the audience. Otherwise, it's a quite, quite I, I, have a, I have a very silly question. Well, me too, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Florida uh, animal, mm -hmm. what is the intensity of the field? They have multiple magnets there. The one we're using is 14 Tesla, so 1.4 times 10 to the uh, 5 Gauss. Um, they actually have uh, stable NMR fields as high as 42 Tesla. Which is amazing field, and you, you know, in some cases, it could change the shape of the molecule, even. So, yeah, thank you. Any other question? Yes, Giacomo. Hello. <laughs> Um, it's it's more like comment. Uh, I just wanted it's uh, first of all thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I just wanted to um, draw your attention uh, for, about the introduction that you gave uh, for the possible mechanisms that uh, can uh, uh, achieve some uh, degree of uh, uh, an antiomeric excess. Uh, there, there is a, a series of papers that were, were published by the group of uh, Borghese, uh, Cecchi Pestellini, Yati, and France uh, from 2005 and 2009 about on APJ. And uh, they showed that uh, uh, you can actually have uh, some selective destruction of uh, 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 chiral molecules uh, if they are trapped in uh, uh, the cavities of um, fluffy uh, dust grains uh, orbiting around uh, uh, <clears throat> protostars. Basically, what you get is that uh, due to the geometry of this system and due to the way in which they get aligned, uh, you transform uh, some uh, uh, initial external linear polarization into uh, circular polarization inside the dust grains. And this will uh, selectively uh, destroy some of the uh, molecules. And basically, if I remember correctly, they achieve uh, some something similar to what you obtain uh, a few percent and antiomeric excess, depending on the molecules. So perhaps you may want to have a look at that. So, so that would be like the circularly polarized light work um, that they've done. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And that's that's actually really fascinating work um, because we know it exists. Uh, it's been done in the laboratory in cold chemistry as well. Um, um, but yeah, they they did a lot of good work. I, I, I'm definitely aware of those papers. Uh, I apologize for not um, presenting them. I, I mentioned circular CPL very briefly, and then I kind of kind of went on. But thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let thanks Mike again and uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Merry Christmas.
Paolo, ci sei ancora? 